Hey, welcome to Brain Mini Lecture number two. Uh, number two. Uh, we had finished up last time talking a little bit about CSF. Now, CSF is going to be made in your choroid plexuses. And a choroid plexus is a special capillary found in each ventricle. Now, here I see all four of my ventricles. I see a lateral ventricle on the right, a lateral ventricle on the left. I see my third ventricle in the middle of the diencephalon there. And I see my fourth ventricle down here, actually between the brainstem and the cerebellum. So these are my four ventricles. Notice the basic shapes of them. Look how big the lateral ventricles are, how curvy, how horn-shaped they are. Notice how there is going to be a foramen on each side linking the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle. So each of those is called an interventricular foramen. And then notice how we have this passageway basically from here to here connecting the third and fourth ventricles, and that passageway is known as the cerebral aqueduct. All right, let's look at a few more views of our ventricles. This is kind of like the picture we saw earlier, a little bit different. Basically, we can think about every ventricle is making CSF. So they're showing us the lateral ventricle kind of behind the diencephalon right there. And in that lateral ventricle, we're going to make CSF. The CSF is going to flow into the third ventricle. Here's the third ventricle. Notice there's a choroid plexus in each of those. So the third ventricle makes its own CSF, plus it gets CSF from both laterals. Then the CSF goes down the cerebral aqueduct all the way down like this arrow here into the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is going to then also make its own CSF. And from the fourth ventricle, CSF can go down through the central canal of the spinal cord, but also CSF can leave the fourth ventricle. So if you look right here, there's going to be an opening there are, in fact, a trio of openings in the fourth ventricle. So each fourth ventricle, the fourth ventricle, has three holes. There, is, there are a pair of lateral holes, and the word aperture is used, and there is one median aperture. The aperture we're looking at with this green arrow that I drew is the median aperture. All right. Now, so those apertures are getting us into the C getting the CSF into the subarachnoid space, and we can go around the spinal cord, down in front, behind the spinal cord, around and behind the brain. Dun 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 dun. Right in here, in here, in here. Now, on this picture. Do notice that we have a dural sinus here. And a dural sinus here as well. The dural sinus is going to have arachnoid villi. Here's an arachnoid villus. So if I can get a, I can't get a circle around it. Ah, can I move the circle? Nope. Can't do that one either. Over oh, two. Anyway, the I'm gonna make a square. Ah, there's the arachnoid villus right there. And that is where the CSF returns to the bloodstream. All right. Awesome. Let's keep going. Boom. Here we're zooming in on a choroid plexus. So here's a choroid plexus. Fluid from blood is going to go from the inside this capillary here, out into the cavity of the ventricle, what the white space is going to be. 
And it's going to have glucose, oxygen, vitamins, ions, the usual suspects. And <clears throat> meanwhile, waste and other stuff can get absorbed. But what I want you to notice is these ependymal cells. These ependymal cells, look at their cilia. The cilia provide the sweeping action that is going to move the CSF. All right. Now, <clears throat> that, the, whoa, went too far. The capillary I just showed you a moment ago that was a choroid plexus capillary. It is unique in the amount of exchange it allows. Most brain blood capillaries, like this guy right here, I don't want a square, I want an arrow, like this guy right here, most brain capillaries are going to have tight junctions between their lining, tight junctions between their endothelial cells. This makes it hard for something bad. Let's say there was a bad bacterium. There was a bad bacterium in this bloodstream. We don't want the bad bacterium to get out of the bloodstream. How do we prevent it? Well, tight junctions between endothelial cells will do it. But that's not all. Notice that I have an astrocyte up here. And my astrocyte sticks out these extensions, which then have these feet. And these feet wrap around the blood vessel. These feet are actually called perivascular feet because they go around the vessel. Peri around ves vascular vessel. All right. So the combination of the astrocytes and the tight junctions are going to create the blood-brain barrier, which protects the CSF and thus the brain from any bad things like this elephant-shaped bacterium in the blood. All right, let's get rid of all this stuff. And let's look at now the gross anatomy of the brain. There are four main parts to the brain. They are the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is going to be the biggest part. We're probably going to spend the most time on it. And then tucked away under the cerebrum is the diencephalon. And then coming down below the diencephalon is the brainstem. And then behind, posterior to the brainstem, is the cerebellum. So those are our four major parts to our brain. All right, let's start with the cerebrum. The cerebrum is actually separated into two halves. There are going to be two cerebral hemispheres. So I put a box around one, and then you can see the other one as well. The two cerebral hemispheres are separated by a longitudinal fissure. A fissure is a deep crack, and the longitudinal fissure is this guy. Let's see if I can draw all the way through him, sort of-ish. There he is. That's the longitudinal fissure. Separates the cerebrum into two hemispheres. We see one of the hemispheres, the left hemisphere, over here as well. Now, overall, the two hemispheres make up four-fifths. In other words, 80% of your brain. This is obviously the majority. These are big, important parts of our brain. All right. Now, most of the, not most, all the cerebral hemisphere surface is going to be really wrinkly. We're going to have ridges. Each ridge is, ridge is called a gyrus. And in grooves, each groove is called a sulcus. And this happens because the brain grows faster than bone. And what that does is it forces the cerebrum to fold in on itself as 
we grow.